Okay, so tonight, Be'ezra Sashem, we're going to be starting a new series of Shirim, which is not really a new series because it's really a continuation of all of the previous Shirim that we've been giving as well. One of the cheshbonos that I made in not giving the last year on the world of Ishbitz and Radzin on the particular sugi of Techilas is that there's no better hemshech into the world of Techilas then entering into the sugyos of Rav Itchemeyer Morgenstern Shlita and his Torah. Not only does Rav Itchemeyer Morgenstern Shlita wear Tcheles and, and fight for the mitzvah of Tcheles and utilize the writings of the Sod Yisharim of Ishbitz and Radzin for the Indian of Tcheles in all of its facets, but Tcheles and the concept of a Tachlis, the concept of a singular purpose that grounds everything and that all particular details that abound in their multiplicity are in truth rooted in one particular point of tachlis, of significance, which is what the mitzvah of Tcheles represents, comes out, at least for me at this stage, clearest in the writings and the teachings of Rav Itchemeyer. Now, when it comes to beginning a new series of shirim on a living tzaddik, there's a certain level of trepidation, a certain level of concern that is not necessarily there when teaching about a tzaddik who has already passed away or a tzaddik who has died. Now, until now, what we've looked at is the teachings of Rav Kook. We've looked at the teachings of the Leshem Shabal Vachaloma, Rav Shlomo Yashiv, Skusi Yogan We've looked at the teachings of our Mikubalim and our Bali Hasidus and the Talmidim of the Gra in terms of the Esther Svira, so Avoda, we tried to see what our tzaddikim had to say about the Indian of the inner world of addiction. We spend time on the world of Ishbitz and Radzin. And there's a certain comfort in talking about what the tzaddikim who have already passed away have to say, because their kavod and their honor and their proper place within the historical dissemination of Torah has been codified and has been concretized so that nobody is going to question the validity of what these tzaddikim have to say. And therefore sharing their Torah is not as frightening because you're sharing something that is already set in stone. People understand how important this Torah is. When it comes to a living tzaddik, when it comes to a tzaddik who shares their Torah in their lifetime, or that as our generation is zochatu to touch a number of tzaddikim who share such a massive amount of Torah in our lifetime, there's a concern that one may impinge on the honor or the kavod or the emes or the truth that that particular tzaddik is trying to convey, especially because that tzaddik is still alive and there's the concern that people may have the wrong interpretation of their Torahs when received through a secondary source. So what I want to be mocked him with before saying anything else, and this is going to be a hakdama that I give at every shir that begins now and ends with the end of the series on Rav Itchemeyer, is that everything that I say, both parenthetically and rooted in the text itself, is my personal interpretation of the writings of Rav Itchemeyer Morgenstern, my personal interpretation of what this particular tzaddik is coming to share in the world of Torah, in the world of Machshava, in the world of Hasidus, in the world of the Gra and his Tamidim, in the world of the Ramchal, in the world of the Rashash, in the world of the Baal Hasulam, in the world of nearly every facet of Torah, which not only does Rav Shemayar touch upon each world and each Shita opinion of Torah, but he has a full grasp of every single approach to Pnimiya Satorah at his fingertips and is sharing it in a way that has been renewed and formed into one powerful, direct derech of Torah that Rav Itchemeyer Morgenstern has brought into the world. Everything I say is my own personal interpretation of those writings. It is not by any means any authoritative statement about what Rav Itchemeyer means or what Rav Itchemeyer may have meant, but rather it is my own personal interpretation as somebody who has been reading these writings for a long period of time now of what this particular tzaddik means to share through his Torah. What we're going to be discussing tonight, Ezra Sashem, is really just an introduction into the world of Ravitchemeyer. 
And I need to introduce that even while speaking about Rav Meyer, the first statement I'm going to make is that I, I have no idea who Rav Yitzchak Meyer Morgenstern is. I've been zochad to sit with him a few times through the work of good friends. I've been able to, uh, through a certain mode of rachamim to receive a haskama, an approbation from him on a kuntras that I put out. But beyond those interactions, my main access to Rav Meyer Morgenstern is through his massive library of writings. Now, we're going to discuss the particular breakdown of those writings a little bit later on tonight, but suffice it to say that any biographical information that's given about Rav Meyer is secondhand, sometimes from close Talmidim of Rav Meyer, but nevertheless it's secondhand, and that one of the unique properties of a living tzaddik, a living teacher who is still living and should continue to live a long and healthy life through Avodah Hashem and through all of the things that the tzaddik needs to carry out, is that the biographical information is sparse. And so what I've tried to do is try to formulate a little bit of a picture, a little bit of a sketch of this individual, this tzaddik whose Torah we're going to be trying to learn over the next nine to 10 weeks or so. Now, Rav Meyer Morgenstern, whose name is Rav Yitzchak Meyer, and because he comes from a family of Gera Hasidim, his father of Yaakov was a Gera Hasid, living in Golders Green, London. And in Gur, in Ger, the typical way of pronouncing the name, Yitzchak is Itcha. The original Rebbe of Gur Hasidus was Rav Yitzchak Meir of Gur, Rav Yitzchak Meir Alter, the Chedush Arim. And famously, he was referred to as Rav Meir as well. And now Ravitchemeyer was born in the year 1967, which makes Ravitchemeyer 52 years old, which is somewhat difficult to believe when you understand the sheer amount of output that this individual has been capable of doing, really in only about 25 to 30 years of teaching. Ravitchemeyer, after spending time in London, learning in the yeshivos in London, learning in Gateshead, he eventually made his way over to Eretz Yisrael, and around 1994 or so, leaving a Satmer-based medrash where he began to share his own Torah at Shalashudis amongst Hasidim Makshivim, amongst students who were deciding to listen to him, he eventually moved forward and created his own base medrash on 18 Rehov Oale Yosef, a small, almost broken down space where when a person enters into that space, you wonder where the order is. There's chaos there. There's different types of individuals who spend their time there and who hang out in that base medrash. But the amount of Torah and Kedusha and Tahara and information and novelty in the world of Panimiya Satora as well as Niglo Satora, I don't want to use the word unparalleled because we live in a particular generation where you could count on your fingers actually four or five individuals who are sharing different types of Torah, but at the same level of output. So it would have been historically unparalleled until you reached about the early 2000s when there emerged a certain sect of particular tzaddikim who were unique in the sense that they were not descendants of any particular form of Hasidus, but rather they were yesomim, they were orphaned in the sense that they forged their own path. Now, as we saw in the writings of Ishbitz and Radzin, this concept of being a yasom, this concept of being an orphan, of not having any direct lineage to any source of authoritative knowledge that is based on the familial development of Hasidut and Torah Sapnimius, yasom, the word that stands for orphan, the tzaddikim of Ishbitz and Radzin would always point out, based on the Zohar and the Tikkun Zohar, that it's an acronym for Yafa Toa Umara of a beautiful visage and a beautiful image. Statements that are applied to Yosef at tzaddik, the paradigm of what it means to be a tzaddik. That there's a certain element of a tzaddik where the beauty emerges specifically in the orphaned nature of the tzaddik. The fact that the tzaddik is not stuck within the process of holy nepotism, wherein they are disclosing the teachings of their father or their grandfather or great-grandfather and so on and so forth. But rather, there are mashpiim, there are certain sadikim that emerged at a particular point in time in our generation who were capable of creating a new path, a new form of hafatsa. 
in, in my mind, the tzaddikim that I would include within this sugya, and obviously that's a limited interpretation, there are many, many more, would be Rav Itchemeyer Morgenstern, would be Rav Avram Tzvi Kluger, Shlita, who's written more, if not, as, as much, if not more than Rav Itchemeyer. Rav Matil Zilber, the Stachina Rebbe, who, whose shirim are published on different topics and there's a massive amount of information, as well as Rav Itamar Schwartz, the Belavi Mishkan Evne, who's also put out a, a massive amount of literary output, yet is continuing to show a fundamental path in Avodah Hashem that runs throughout all of the Svarim, and the same could be true about each of those Sadiqim. It's possible that you can include Rav Moshe Shapiro within this entire sugya because his writings are now being published posthumously, but in his lifetime it was a very different Indian than this concept of a tzaddik. Nevertheless, we live in a time or in a period where there has been a unique explosion of Torah from these particular tzaddikim who don't come from any specific dynasty of Hasidus or Machshav or Panimiya Satora. And on a certain level, that orphaned nature has given birth to that Yafa Toa Umare, that Yasom, that fact that they're orphaned from any form of nepotism has given birth to the fact that there's novelty that's coming out. And not only novelty, but novelty that speaks to the heart of a generation that has seen things broken, that speaks to the heart of a generation who has very often lost hope in the forms of chasidus, in the forms of Torah, in the forms of emuna and bitachon, and the ability to mitmodate in this world. It's specifically these tzaddikim who have forged paths that not only do they acknowledge the struggle of being a believing individual in the year 2019, but they take the struggle and they place it in the crown of their system. That for these tzaddikim, the struggle of what it means to be a Jew at the end of history is part and parcel of what makes being Jewish so profoundly beautiful. That in confronting the darkness, in confronting the concealment, in confronting the hester and the hastir astir as panai, these tzaddikim have taken these sugyos of Hester, and it very often goes by different names. We've seen it throughout the series of Shiram that I've been trying to give, or at least I've seen it in what I'm expressing. That it's the tzimtzum, it's the shvira, it's the concealment and the brokenness and the intensity and the fallen nature of things and the anxiety and the vulnerability. And it's specifically in those places that these tzaddikim descend into allowing us to see that not only is it okay to feel these things, but feeling these things is what enables our generation, in spite of our lowly nature, to raise to the top of the crown. Evan Masu Abanam Haisala Rosh Pina. The stone that was despised by the builders turns out to be the loftiest stone, in the sense that, yes, we're broken, yes, we're fallen, yes, we're lost. But in spite of all of that, it's that fallenness and that brokenness and that lostness that we elevate and we serve Hashem with it. And it's specifically these tzaddikim and what we're going to be discussing and in my own particular experience, it's clearest in the writings of Ravitchemeyer Morgenstern. I shouldn't say it's clearest in the writings of Ravitchemeyer. It's clear in nearly every one of the tzaddikim we referred to before, of Avram Tzvi Kluger, Shlita, and Ravitchemeyer Schwartz, Shlita, and Rav Matil Zilber, Shlita, as well as Ravitchemeyer, but Ravitchemeyer describes it at the loftiest level. Ravitchemeyer is describing it on the level of ontology, on the level of Kabbalah. He's showing it within the Arizal. He's showing it within all of our tzaddikim, which we're going to discuss. Now, Ravitch Shemayr moves to Eretz Yisrael and he opens up this base medrash. When we look at the sources or origins of Ravitch Shemayr's teachings, there's a number of influences that are revealed at least. When Ravitch Shemayr was in Gateshead, it's apparent to any of the Talmidim who I've spoken to, who happened to have been in Gateshead at the time that Rav Itchemeyer was there. Some are professors and some are businessmen, but all of them remember that Rav Itchemeyer was unique. As a 13, 14 year old, Rav Itchemeyer was already spending hours and hours in preparation for davening, hours and hours in davening, yet everything was done in a way that it would be possible for him to join the normal order of the yeshiva. What is unique in that idea is that there was an anava, there's a humility that constitutes all of the stories about Rav Itchemeyer in his youth. That in spite of the intensity and the ferocity of his avoda, 
There's a story that somebody looked at his sitter when he was 11 years old and they saw different permutations of names and Yehudim, different unifications that the Arizal writes down. So we're not talking about somebody who is operating on a normal level by any means. But in spite of that, what comes out most out of these stories is the humility, the concealment, the tznius, the modesty in which Rav approaches and continues to approach all of these particular aspects of inner avoda. Now, after his time in Gateshead, as a bachar, he still wanted to enter into the world of Panimiya Satora. And there's a general prohibition against teaching Panimiya Satora, Kabbalah, mysticism, however you want to phrase it, to individuals who are, are below a certain age as a result of certain catastrophic traumas, Sabbateanism that have taken place in Jewish history. Therefore, there's been a pro prohibitive form of secrecy that has been imposed on esoteric secrets. But Rav Itchemeyer Morgenstern found a mashpia in London by the name of Rav Pinchas Young, who apparently had a chabura of young individuals who he would be willing to teach Kabbalah to. And around that time, Rav Itchemeyer also found himself close to the Rebbe of Krechnev. The Rebbe of Krechnev is unique in the sense that the Rebbe of Krechnev was obsessed with the writings of Chabad, with the writings of all of the generations of Chabad, in particular the Balhatanya. And as we're going to see throughout this series of Shiram, one of the fundamental sources of Rav Itchemeyer Morgenstern's derech in Avodah Sashem and his derech in teaching Torah is the world of Chabad, is the Balatanya, the Rebbe, the Tzemach Tzedek. The Maharash, the Rebbe of Shmuel, doesn't emerge too much in the writings that I've seen, but it doesn't mean that he's not fundamentally important. The Rebbe Rashab, the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe, is a Kesser by Rav Itchemeyer, is one of the fundamental sources, at least in my opinion, of where Rav Itchemeyer is drawing his Seder Halimud and his ontological view of what this world is and how HaKadosh Baruch Hu interacts with this world. The Rebbe Rayat's not so much, and, and, and the Rebbe, the seventh Rebbe of Lubavitch, also becomes very significant, but in a unique way, as we're going to discuss in future Shirim. So these mashpiim had an influence on Rav Itchemeyer. Later on, when Rav Itchemeyer came to Yerushalayim, he met one of the most important, or what seems to be one of the most important mashpiim in his life, which is Rav Nosen David Kivak Shlita, one of the Gedole mashpiim, one of the Gedole Hatzadikim in Breslov nowadays. Also the Rebbe of Rav Avram Sli Kluger. He drew Rav Avram Sli Kluger close to Breslov as well. There's videos on YouTube of Rav Itchemeyer Morgenstern visiting his Rebbe, Rav Nosen David Kivak, on Purim. And aside from the remarkable, intense form of Tahara, and purity and holiness that Rav Itchemeyer is engaged in in the video, in the sense that he had washed Natila Sidayim and he's not willing to get his hands dirty even in the slightest way, the amount of kavod and silence that he allows himself to engage in when sitting with his Rebbe is remarkable. And this was by Sudas Purim. There's a remarkable video of it on, on YouTube. Now, what Rav Itchemeyer received from Rav Nassim David Kivak, I have no idea. But what it resulted in is clear, is that if Rav Itchemeyer Morgenstern considers himself anything, it's a chassid of Breslov. That at the end of the day, everything that Rav Itchemeyer says comes back to what Rabbi Nachman has to say. And that what Rav Itchemeyer is trying to show is how the derech of Rabbi Nachman and how the derech of Breslov contains and holds together all of the other shitos that we could possibly understand, whether it be the Ramchal, whether it be the Gro, whether it be the Rashash or the Arizal, that Rabbi Nachman of Breslov comes to hold the entire system together with a novelty that allows us to move a step above. Something that Amir Tzashem we're going to be able to discuss in the series of Shirem later on. And it could be that this series of Shirem, depending on listeners' response or interest or Merebi's advice, it will continue beyond 10 Shirem. So we see that Rav Itchemeyer Morgenstern has a number of influences. There's this Rav Pinchas Young who opens him up to the world of Kabbalah. There's the Krechnef Rebbe who opens him up to the world of Chabad Hasidus, of Hisboininus, of ontological speculation of the workings of HaKadosh Baruch Hu and how he interacts with our world. There's a massive opening into the world of Rabbi Nachman and into the world of Breslov, which will save for its own sheer. 
And all of these inspirations and all of these forms of influence emerge in what we see in Ravitch Meyer's writings. Before I speak about the last Rebbe of Ravitch Meyer that I know of, Rav Moshe Shach Shlita, one of the Gedolei HaMikubalim, one of the biggest Kabbalists of our generation who lives in Givat Shaul, in a modest apartment, which I've had the schus to sit in and learn with him, I want to read a letter, a letter that was actually brought to my attention from my brother, my brother Rabbi Josh Rosenfeld. And this letter describes a little bit of what was going on when Ravitch Meyer Morgenstern was a younger child, I guess you can say. This letter was written in 1979. Ravitch Meyer was born in 1967, which puts Ravitch Meyer at 12 years old. This was a letter written by Rav Aaron Bramfman. Rav Aaron Bramfman, who was the Menahel of Yeshiva Farakaway. I don't know much about him, although I know that he was a holy individual because of the people who spoke about him after his sudden patira and the way they spoke about him after his patira. But this is a letter, and I'm not sure how this letter came about. I believe that Mordechai ben David, who's a chassid of Ravichamai Morgenstern, played a role in it, although I could be mistaken. And I want to read to you this letter, which just concretizes a little bit of what we're dealing with here. This is a letter, and again, this is a letter that can be found on social media. September 3rd, 1979. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Morgenstern, I have rewritten this letter four times, each time differently because I want to express myself without sounding ridiculous or creating a new anxiety about Yitzhak Meyer Nishmaso Ya'ir, may his soul shine, and his potential. I truly feel, in parentheses, as do others, that he is something special. I have seen many bright boys, but never the combination of a good head, hasmada, yura shamayim, and midos tovos, as one sees in in Yitzchak Meir Nishmaso Ya'ir. Again, we're talking about a 12-year-old here. And this was Rav Aharon Bramfman, who knew Rav Yitzchak from camp. His joy in learning and his sensitivity and understanding is just beautiful. And it is all natural, not forced, which is why he is a perfectly normal, happy child. I can tell you I felt an aura of purity and holiness when I learned or talked with him. I felt that I had an image, in parentheses, of course, our later generations are of a lower level, end parentheses, of what the Chafetz Chaim or the Chazon Ish may have been like in their youth. I am not saying this facetiously. He electrified and captivated the entire camp. If this stays with him and he grows in learning, he will someday be a manhig Yisrael, a leader of Israel. Again, written in 1979. I'm sorry if this makes you feel a bit concerned because it is an awesome responsibility, but you are blessed with a special gift. And he continues to offer certain advice to Ravitch Meyer's parents about how they should go about allowing Ravitch Meyer to learn and develop his learning in a particular way and not to be stifled by the typical curriculum that students at that time had gone through. And then he continues and he says, after he develops his own seder, his own path in learning, he will probably finish the rest of Shas on his own. And he should continue to be exposed to people who are great and gedolim in order to develop his form of understanding. And this is the line that I underlined twice because I think it's so proficient and I think it's almost the level of Ruach HaKodesh. And ultimately he will choose and create his own derech in learning. Meaning to say that Ravitch Meyer has the capacity to create a new way of understanding the Torah, to look at Torah in a somewhat different way than, had it, than had it been looked at before. Something novel. I hope someday to be able to say that I had the schus, the merit of learning with him when he was young. And I want to repeat that I have not gone mad. I deal with hundreds of Bahrim, I deal with hundreds of young boys, and I have been in education for 14 years. With best wishes for a Kasiva of a Chasima Tova and a good Geben Shtior, sincerely Rabbi Aaron Brafman. P.S. Regards to Yitzchak Meyer. The letter is incredible in the sense that when you look at the particular emphases that are placed on in that letter, they all emerge to be true. 
but it's also anecdotal evidence of the fact that we're dealing with somebody whose holiness was apparent from the get-go. Once Rav Meyer already had made a name for himself, or already has made a name for himself, by teaching his Torahs of Shalashudas, those Shalashudas Torahs, which are some of the more profound Torahs, Torahs that we're not necessarily going to be discussing in this series of Shirim, as we're going to discuss, are compiled under the title of De'e Chachma L'Nafshecha, of Your Soul Should Know Wisdom, from the Zemer of Shabbos lunch of Duror Yikra. Because every Shalashudas Drasha that Rav Meyer has given has been formed around the verse of De'e Chachma L'Nafshecha Ki Keser L'Roshecha, that one should know Chachma, one should know wisdom for their soul, because in truth, it's the crown to their head. What Rav Meyer is talking about here, we're not going to get into, because it would take years to learn through the writings and understand exactly what he sees in that Pasuk, Lefi Anias according to my humble opinion. Nevertheless, those writings have been around since 1994. Rav Itchemeyer began teaching Kabbalah in a more open way at the beginning of year 2000. One of the sources through which he draws his Havana, through which he draws his understanding of the Arizal and the Rashash of Shalom Sharabi, who Mir Hashem throughout this process will be able to give a series of Shiraman as well, is Rav Moshe Shatz Lita. Rav Moshe Shatz must be around 75, 80 years old, is a Jew who was born in Brooklyn, a tzaddik, who was, a, a makubal who was born in Brooklyn, I believe went to Yeshiva University, went to YU, and eventually made his way to Eretz Yisrael, and he learned in the Yeshiva of Beit El in the Old City. And after that, he began developing his own understanding of things, his own understanding of the material. Rav Shatz goes on to find what he describes as the key to understanding the Arizal, which we're going to see throughout the series of Shiram is the concept of Rabbeinu Azriel of Gerona. Now again, Rabbeinu Azriel of Gerona, the Rabbi of the Ramban, is what we introduced the opening Shir of Reish Milin on, and which we sowed was the foundational crown and the jewel of the Leshem Shubav Achaloma. That Rabbeinu Azriel teaches us that it's not only infinitude that is significant, but it's finitude as well that is significant. It's not only the unlimited, which is important in understanding Hashem, but it's particularly the limited. And that infinity cannot be infinite without the capacity to manifest infinitude. And that goodness cannot be possible unless it can make its way through badness as well. And that light is insignificant unless it has the capacity of transforming darkness as well into light. And that human experience is only valuable when we're able to descend into the difficult particulars of modern and postmodern existence and still find HaKadosh Baruch Hu there. That's specifically the avoda that Rabbeinu Azriel of Gerona comes to teach our generation. And what I heard from Rav Moshe Shatz Shlita is that Rav Itchemeyer had heard that Rav Moshe Shatz had kol kitve Rav Avram Abulafia. The blue writings of Rav Avram Abulafia. Rav Avram Abulafia was a 10th, 12th century, 13th century prophetic mekubal who continues to be the foundation of many of our current tzaddikim, in particular forms of their avoida. One of the unique aspects of Rav Avrama Bulafia was that he saw meditation and contemplative mindfulness as fundamental forms of avoda Hashem. And Rav Itchemeyer had heard that Rav Moshe Shatz had the collection of these writings. And I believe that this was prior even to Rav Itchemeyer's beginning to teach openly, at least in the way that his writings contain his teachings. And Rav Itchemeyer came to Rav Moshe Shatz's apartment in the Givat Shoal, asking for the Svarim, to borrow the Svarim. And he saw that Rav Moshe Shatz Shlita had something open on his laptop, something being typed up. And he looked at it and he decided that Rav Moshe Shatz was going to be one of his Rebbeim. And they spent hours and hours and hours and hours and days and weeks spending time together, learning the writings of the Rashash and the Arizal, learning how to be Mechavin properly, learning how, how to have the proper intentions, and to understand the secret of Partsuf, of what the Partsuf means, which we discussed in the series of Shiraman Sviros. 
And one of the fundamental lessons that Rav Schatz apparently had on Rav Itchemeyer, as I understand through his writings, is that it is this concept of the koya hagvul, the sense that limitation itself is what allows the unlimited to become bigger, that darkness itself is what allows light to become more potent, that limitation is what shows us the true power of the unlimited, which means on a psychological and practical level that one of the fundamental points of the system of Rav Shatz and the system of Rav Itchemeyer Morgenstern Shlita is that in order to truly experience or understand the power and the intensity of Hashem's presence in the world, a person needs to enter into the space where that presence is occluded, where that presence appears to be concealed, where the light of HaKadosh Baruch Hu seems to be hidden behind the dark cloud of concealment. And instead of ignoring the concealment or suppressing the concealment or ignoring the concealment and repressing it and pretending it doesn't exist, Rav Meyer Morgenstern, through his teachings as they're explicated in the writings of Yama Chochma, forces the individual, the reader, the learner, the Talmud, or the want to be Talmud, into the depths of darkness, into the depths of limitation, into the limits of the mind, wherein it's almost no longer possible to see how it could be that Hashem's infinitude and power still remains there. And he shows you, Dafka, that in that place that is so incredibly far from where you conceive Hashem to be, there too and specifically there a person can reveal the light of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Specifically in that place a person has the power to reveal the light of Yichud. And not only is the light of Yichud still present there, but it is specifically the places of concealment, the particularity, the pratiyut, the musag of bina, the mindset of the left brain of bina, which sees constriction and separation and concealment and darkness and hiddenness and difficulty and anxiety and forlornness and limitation. It's specifically that that allows us to reveal the deepest power of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That without that intensity that comes about through Gevura, without that intensity that comes about through Tzimtzum and concealment and Pratiyut and particularity, a person can never truly touch or taste the power and the taste that the whole can offer. It's specifically Rav Itchemeyer's writings that have come and shown this in the clearest way possible. And it's clear that he learned this from his Rebbe of Moshe Shachlita who eventually, Bezras Hashem, after we complete this series of shirim, will one day be a series of shirim on its own to try and teach the, the limited speck that Rav Moshe Shatz has written down in the Sefer Tarshish Shom V'Yishpe, which is a hakdama to the parish of Rabbeinu Azriel on the Esther Sviros. Mirz Hashem, we should be zochet to give a shir on that and to give a shir on Rabbeinu Azriel and to give a shir on all of the Yisodos up to and including where it comes from in the depths of the Zohar HaKadosh. Rav Itchemeyer Morgenstern forces the individual to descend into the limits of their mind to reveal that there too rests and abides the light of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and not only that it rests there, but that is specifically the place where we are meant to reveal it. And this is where I find personally and humbly the particular significance of Rav Itchemeyer Morgenstern for our particular generation where things have apparently lost their way, where things appear to be devoid of order, where the light of infinity is occluded by finitude, where the light of unity seems to be covered over by the apparent duality of separateness in the world, where the light of or and oneness seems to be covered over by choyshech. It's specifically here that Rav Itchemeyer comes to show that no, don't give in to the darkness, Recognize that the darkness is just there to allow for the light to emerge in a more potent and intensified way. My Rebbe of Moshe Weinberger Shlita gave a shear, I don't know how many years ago, I heard it about five or six years ago, on Oyrus HaKodesh, on the writings of Rav Kook as compiled by the Nazir HaKodesh, by Rav David Kohn and Rav Tzvi Yehuda, and in the third volume of Oyrus HaKodesh, Rav Kook has a particular description of fear of death and the anxiety of death, where he describes the chesion hashav shal hamavas, the fake vision, the fake obsession with death, 
And in this year, which I have yet to locate, but I have a haskama from Rav Moshe Weinberger about saying this, is that in, in opposition to the chsoikak seal that we find so often in Mishle, in opposition to the laughter of the fool, to the laughter of those who want to deny the significance of this world, to find meaninglessness in this world, there is a schreik of kedusha. there is a laughter of holiness. And parenthetically, when Rav Weinberger was describing this laughter of holiness, he gave an example of Rav Itchemeyer Morgenstern. Now Rav Moshe Weinberger Shlita, amongst all of the tzaddikim we described before, Rav Itchemeyer and Rav Avram Tzvi Kluger and Rav Matil Zilber and Rav Itchemeyer Schwartz, none of these tzaddikim would be accessible to the modern Orthodox consciousness without the work of Rav Moshe Weinberger Shlita that on a certain level, this captain of the ship has allowed for all of these teachings to find their way down to the lowest common denominator of what it means to be a Jew. To those individuals who are so far from the light of Hasidus, that would have been impossible for the light of Hasidus to come down except through this conduit. He should live and be well for 120 years and continue teaching us. Nevertheless, Rav Moshe Weinberger Shlita in this year says as follows. He says that, in contradistinction to the laughter of nihilism, the nihilistic laughter which denies any significance and any meaning in the world, there's the laughter of a tzaddik of v'tischak liyom acharon, of a laughter of the last day, a laughter of Mashiach, a laughter of Geula. Now this laughter, as we discussed in the shirim on the Leshem, and Emir Tzashem will discuss in a series of shirim that we hope to give on Yitzchak Avinu, Yitzchak Avinu, who is the source of all of this, of all of these sugyos, of the ability of a Jew to descend into darkness, into concealment, and show that Hashem rests there as well. The laughter of Yitzchak, of Schoik Asali Elohim, that God in his form of judgment and constriction has allowed me to laugh. There is a laughter of the tzaddikim which allows us to taste the laugh of Mashiach, to taste the laughter that will emerge in the world through the theory of incongruity when everything we thought which was going wrong and dark is revealed to have been preparing us for Mashiach, preparing us for redemption, preparing us for the giloy of a new Torah, of a Torah of Atika Kadisha, of an ancient Torah that is both new and old in a paradoxical way, which we can only hope to describe by way of metaphor in the future. And Rav Weinberger says that it's Rav Itchemeyer Morgenstern in a particular sense who represents this attitude of v'tishak liyom acharon. Because anybody who sees pictures of Rav Itchemeyer or has met or had the schluss to meet with Rav Itchemeyer sees that there's a grin, there's a laugh, there's a smile that almost says, in my own humble opinion, that yes, in spite of the fact that everything appears to be constricted and dark and concealed in the world of Torah, as well as in the world of ontological reality, nevertheless, yeshin yan sh'yitapecha kol. As Rabbi Nassim of Nemerov, the Talmud of Rabbi Nachman, Schusia Ganalenu teaches over and over, there is something that flips everything around. There is a point that if a person is zoichet to touch it, has the ability to transform all darkness into light, has the ability to transform all bitterness into sweetness. And it's that Nakuda that Rav Itchemeyer's Torah is coming to show our generation. And he doesn't show this in any fluffy way. Rav Itchemeyer has an entire hold, a complete and entire control of the entirety of the writings of the Arizal, of the Rashash, of the Torah's Chacham, Rav Chaim de la Rosa, which is what his base medrash is named after, Yeshiva Torah Chacham. I cannot even begin to describe how complicated and difficult the Sefer of Torah Chacham is. I've opened it numerous times, closing it each and every time. Not that that's a raya, I don't understand anything anyway. But the Torah's Chacham is a complicated, complex, and almost impossible Sefer to understand. What Rav Itchemeyer has done with the Sefer of Torah's Chacham, as we're going to see, hopefully in a particular shir, is remarkable because he reads the Torah's Chacham in a way that it's almost impossible to ignore it. That you can find Rabbi Nachman in the Torah's Chacham. You can find the Baal Shem Tov in the Torah's Chacham. You can find the Gra and the Ramchal and the Rashash and the Arizal and all of the Tamidim within the Torah's Chacham itself. 
So that everything Ravitch Meyer is saying, in spite of the fact that it provides a certain psychological solace for those of us who find ourselves b'shule hagluma at the end of the lowest of lowest of levels, Ravitch Meyer is showing us that this is rooted in the highest of levels. That nothing Ravitch Meyer is saying is not said by tzaddikim who preceded him. And Ravitch Meyer has the hasagos and the gaonis to show this, that the writings of his talmidim, the ten talmidim, whose names are only written in, in, um, in Roshe Tevos, I'm sorry, in abbreviations, in acronyms. So I know one of the Talmidim's names. Many, know, many people know the names of the Talmidim. One of them has already began to publish Svarim. That's Rav Shmuel Ehrenfeld Shlita, who has written many of the Svarim as well. The others have chosen to remain anonymous, I believe, and therefore I'm not going to try and share their names. But the writings themselves undergo an intense investigation into the textual history of Panimia Satora in all of its facets, and what they do with it is simply remarkable. If at a certain point in history it was difficult to learn the sugyos of Kabbalah, and when I say the sugyos of Kabbalah, I mean learning Kabbalah like a person learns a sugya in Gemara, or like a person learns a sugya in Halacha, with an abiding awareness to the details and a, an unwillingness to allow there to be any contradictions whatsoever, what the Tamidim of Ravichamayr have done in Ravichamayr's writings is, in my humble, humble opinion, historically unprecedented. Kabbalah and Pnimiya Sa Kabbalah, Razin de Razin, the secrets of secrets, have never been as accessible as they are in the writings of Yam HaChachma. In the yearbooks of Yam HaChachma, the thousand page yearbook, yearbooks, which have been coming out already for 10 years plus, that Ravichamayr and his Tamidim put out in all of the multifarious writings and all of the different valences and shapes of those writings. And what I'm going to try and do in this series of Shirim, Be'ezra Sashem, is show what my humble understanding of these writings are through 10 particular aspects of an idea that hold, in my opinion, the entire system of Ravichamai and Morgenstern together. That amongst the 25,000, 30,000 pages of written Torah that have emerged in the base medrash of Avichamayr Morgenstern over the past 20 years, I believe that there is a systematicity that abides within the depths of the system. Meaning to say, there's one way to look at the writings of Avichamayr Morgenstern and to say there's a massive amount of genius here, there's a massive quantity of teachings, and there's a massive amount of novelty, but recognizing the massive quantity of writings doesn't necessarily recognize that there is an inherent system within the writings themselves. As my very close friend, Yedid Nafshi, Rav Davida Weinberger reminded me, Rav Davida Weinberg, I'm sorry, reminded me that when the Nazir HaKadosh came to codify or compile the writings of Rav Kook, he said, Rebbe, there's beauty here. There's poetry here, but is there a system here? And eventually it was the Nazir himself who showed that, yes, there was a system. I believe very deeply that in spite of the sheer quantity of the writings of Ravichamayr, that there is an inherent system at play. There are other people who are close with Ravichamayr who will taina and who will say that all of this comes directly to Ravichamayr and there's no pre-thought to it and there's no systematicity to it. The Mechilas Kvodam, I disagree with it to the nth degree. I believe that Ravichamayr Morgenstern has a very clear system of understanding how Kabbalah works, and for us, how the world works, how psychology works, how the human soul experiences reality. And what I'm going to try and show is 10 specific examples that comprise a particular Nakuda, one Nakuda Kolelas, one point that contains the all that on a certain level serves as a foundation, as a proper hakdama to the 30,000 plus writings, 30,000 plus pages of writings of Ravichamayr Morgenstern. Each year is going to be particular emphasis on a different idea. And what we're going to find is that throughout the series of Shirim, there emerges a picture that will allow us to properly understand our own human experience, and more importantly, how our own human experience 
can be traced back to the writings our, of our biggest tzaddikim. That the anxiety that we feel in this world, that the difficulty that we confront in this world, that the pain that we experience in this world as Dor Acharon, as the last of the generations, as the end of history, is not only psychologically valid, but it's rooted in the Torah itself. It's rooted in the deepest recesses of the Torah. In the entirety of the order of Pnimi Torah, emerging from Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai down to what we understand, emerging from Moshe Rabbeinu, emerging from the origin of Torah down to the lowest manifestations of Torah. Each and every one of our anxieties, our experiences, our difficulties, our experience of the gavul and limitation is rooted in the Torah itself. And Ravit Shemaya reveals this more than anybody else. What, a, what I would like to end with tonight is one teaching from Ravit Shemayar. This is going to be a teaching from Yam HaChachma. Again, Yam HaChachma are the yearbooks that are printed out, and there's different types of essays in them. Yam HaChachma is where most of our Torah is going to be coming from, or at least my own particular understanding of Ravit Shemayar. And we're going to be deliberately ignoring Nishmas and Chadetin, the weekly talks that Ravit Shemayar gives on Shabbos, which are remarkable in their own right. We're going to be ignoring De'i Chachma L'Nafshecha, which on a certain level build off of Yam HaChachma, but take it to a further level, which I believe is nearly impossible to teach in any formal setting. We're going to be ignoring the novel undertaking or the revolutionary undertaking of Ravit Shemayar to follow the path of Rabbi Nassan Nimerov of Breslov, or Rabbi Nassan, the student of Rabbi Nachman, to learn the entirety of Shulchan Orach through Pnei Torah. We're going to be ignoring deliberately the Herculean task of Ravit Shemayar to learn the entire Shas through Pnei Torah, which he's already begun to do. And we're going to focus particularly on the ontology of Ravit Shemayar's Torahs. What Ravit Shemayar teaches us about Hashem, about reality, and most importantly, about the difficult relationship between Hashem and reality. And most of those writings are going to emerge out of Yam HaChachma themselves. Each teaching that we're going to focus on can be backed up by 20 or 30 teachings, but for the sake of brevity and holding any form of system in mind, we're going to focus on one particular teaching each week, and any interest in further teachings, I'd be happy to share. What I want to read today is not part of that system, but an introduction of sorts. This is from Yam HaChachma Tafshin Ayin Dalid, and we're looking at page Kuf Ches, page 138. This is from the Biurim on Masecha Tzitzis, Rav Itchemeyer's parish on the Masechta of Tzitzis, B'derach Pardes. So again, we're ending with where we should have ended off with the concept of Tcheles, the mitzvah of Tzitzis, which is where the Soed Yisharim and the Tzadikim of Ishbitz would have left us off. He writes as follows about Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, and I believe the same can be said about his own teachings, about the teachings of Rabbi Shimon Morgenstern. Regarding our aspect, we can understand why Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai wanted to find Torah within Gullus itself. The famous argument between the Chachamim in Kerem Biavne and Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, which Rabbi Nachman sees as the introduction to all of his writings in the Kutim Maharan, we see that there's an argument about what's going to happen when the Jewish people forget Torah. The Chachamim say that it's possible to forget Torah. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says, no, it's impossible for them to ever, to ever forget Torah. And Ravit Shemayar teaches that the reason Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is capable of saying it's impossible for them to ever forget Torah is because even in darkness they're able to teach Torah. Even in darkness they're able to reveal Torah. And not only that, but darkness allows them to reveal a deeper level of Torah. So it was Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai who saw the incoming darkness of exile, who instead of denying the availability and possibility of Torah within exile, says it's specifically here in exile that we'll be able to find the deepest levels of Torah. And he continues and he says that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai did not want to follow the path of the Chachamim. The Chachamim wanted to ignore, repress, get rid of darkness at its root. They wanted to deny the possibility of nighttime and darkness where things are concealed. 
as if darkness and light and night don't exist at all, as if the nocturnal experience of a Jew where things go bump in the night, where we're anxious, where it's difficult to find faith doesn't exist. The rabbis, the Chachamim wanted to deny that. But Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai had a different derech. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai had a different way of approaching the world. He wanted to emerge from the bottom towards the top. He wanted to start in those lower areas and show how those lower areas specifically are rooted in the loftier areas. He wanted to begin with the knowledge of our experience in the lowly state of the world, that which appears to be darkness and nighttime, a spiritual nighttime, a time that is close to destruction of the Beis Hamikdash and destruction in all of our own personal lives, a time of Gezeros, a time of anti-Semitism, a time of the world of Rome, a time where Shabbos wasn't a possibility for a person. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai wanted to open up the gate of redemption within that specific darkness, within the darkness of darkness, within the darkness of the cave itself, to elevate and negate that darkness to show how that darkness itself contains the light of redemption, to the point that the book that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai writes within the darkness of darkness, within the cave of exile, the Zohar HaKadosh, is the book of Geula, the book through which we are capable of revealing the fact that we've always been in a state of Geula. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai wanted to start from the bottom and elevate it back up to the top. And I believe the same can be true, the same can be said about Ravit Shemayar. Rav Meyer wants to show us how the particularity, the difficulty, the darkness can allow us to potentiate and elevate and multiply and make larger the yichud of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. As if to say that without the encounter with our own personal darkness, without the encounter with our own personal limitation, there would be no possibility of truly and fully revealing the light of HaKadosh Baruch Hu in this world. To end with, we can look at the name of Rav Meyer. When he writes about the name Yitzchak in multiple places, he expresses this as well. Yitzchak is the laughter that emerges out of brokenness. Yitzchak is the one who appears to be devoid of order, devoid of light. But it's specifically Yitzchak who Chazal teach us is going to be the one who redeems us at the end of days. That it's specifically going to be the archetype of severity and concealment who looks at his children at the end of days and says, these are my people. And these are not only my people, but these are your children, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, because they've descended into darkness and descended into particularity to find you. And that's the concept of Yitzchak Meir, that Yitzchak will shine in the future, that the capacity of Rav Meir to show that those areas which appear to be devoid of order and darkness are specifically those levels which will teach us the deepest level of understanding. I believe that that is the Avodah of part and one Nakuda of his Torah. And Be'ezra Hashem, in the next coming weeks, we're going to try and share the Torah of a living tzaddik. This is different than previous shirim that I've given. There's a deeper sense of bittal. I'm not trying to share myself right now. I'm trying to share where all of the Torah that I've shared beforehand comes from. That Rav Itzhemeyer has opened my eyes in a way of looking at life and looking at myself that I can't claim about any other tzaddik. And what I'm going to try and do with Siata Deshmaya Be'ezra Sashem and the Bracha Vatsadik is that I'm going to try and share just a little bit of that, which will hopefully open up the world of Ravichemeyer Morgenstern and the sea of knowledge, the Amha Chachma, which emerges out of the massive amount of writings that he has given us.